Well, I've, I've been on the phone with some of the people in this room, um, a lot of different people. And um, a lot of the times somebody will say to me, hey, Anthony, um, yeah, so I got your emails. It makes sense, but I don't really understand it. Like, can you walk me through it? And the most challenging part about Rhino, which has actually been the most challenging part of my life, is that I overthink everything, but I don't define overthink as a bad thing, right? Like I'm constantly making sure that I've properly quantified all the variables. And one might say, well, Anthony, you're overthinking it because A, B, C, D, E, F, G are never going to happen. But what if they do? Did I overthink it to be prepared for that? Did I overthink it to be expecting it to be prepared for it and be able to pivot based on it? I don't think so, right? Like when you're accountable to other people or at least accountable to even yourself, you kind of need to know where all, the, um, where all the bodies are hidden and which closet you open, who's in a come. I just, I need to know all of it. So when I've had these phone calls, the call usually ends a half hour later and the gentleman or the lady is like, wow, I, now it makes all the sense in the world. And I say, yeah, I, I wish I was able to condense that half hour into like one minute um, with like a really cool pitch, right? Like uh, Rhino Street, just do it, right? Like Nike, which Nike we think is probably the best marketing company. Apple's number two, but Nike is definitely number one. In fact, Nike is such a good marketing company that they don't even tell you about their product. They get a product. They allow you to watch it in the partnership of glory with the athlete. You see Michael Jordan dunking a basketball. You see Nike and you're like, God, I love Michael Jordan. Got to get some Nikes, right? You don't say, oh, but that shoe, it had the springs in it and it allowed him. No, no one, because it's not about that. It's about the passion, right? So let's kind of go through Rhino retirement. And I have notes in front of me, but obviously I'm probably not going to go through that. Let me just kind of walk you through from the top of my head. And I really don't know what's going to happen, but we can try together, right? Okay. So the goal of Rhino has always been, how do we go ahead and properly identify population and empower population to to be distributed the value they deserve, right? How do you properly go ahead and, and allow population or ensure that population is worth what it's worth? And that's kind of difficult, right? So it's like, Anthony, first of all, I don't even know what that sentence means, right? Like your value and population. Because when you, see the thing is, when you have say the overall the overall um, wealth distribution, right? Like the wealth inequality in such a small group of hands that didn't happen by accident. It wasn't like Bill Gates woke up one day and just fell into a bunch of money, right? Like he developed something and God bless him, no one's taking that away. But to make the argument that inventing the computer in his garage or whatever has led him to where he is today in terms of every dollar that is his is based on revenue from that computer. Well, that's a little silly, right? Like he's made other investments. He's probably got some tax incentives. He's probably, you know, probably gotten privy to resources that you and I are not. And it's just that systemic unfairness, right? And it's funny because I never thought I would actually be one to talk about, all right, well, 1% versus 99% because I've always believed in capitalism and I still do. The capitalism, I think it's a really, really rough name where people are like, oh, capitalism got us here. No, capitalism by Adam Smith is that the that resources, that financial resources will go to where they're best treated. And that the, the invisible hands of the market will always make sure that those resources are distributed um, efficiently. So for instance, say I'm you know, selling basketballs. All right, well, why am I so good at selling basketballs, right? Like I'm a profitable company selling basketballs. Oh, maybe of course they're the best basketball. They're the best one, no ball could bounce as good as the basketballs that Anthony makes. Okay, cool. Well, now no one else can compete with me on the best basketball. So what others do is say, okay, he's spending all of his money making the most high-end product. Great. 
let us go ahead and, you know, I don't think everyone wants to spend so much on a basketball. Not everyone's a professional. Maybe they just want a basketball to go shoot around. So let's go ahead and make basketballs in high volume. Yeah, they'll be a little bit less on standard, but we'll be able to go ahead and pump out such a volume, plus save money on the input cost that we can go ahead and sell a cheaper basketball. Okay, well, that's quite important. Now you have two different markets. You have the basketball that's the best and the basketball that's cheaper. Now, in capitalism, now the next thing that happens is, well, now somebody wants to kind of rip you off a little bit, right? So now someone's like, all right, I know how they made their basketball. So let's go ahead and copy their model or, or get cheaper products and say it's theirs or whatnot. And we'll go ahead and sell those basketballs and we'll trick a bunch of people and we'll make a bunch of money. So I, I believe today in capitalism, people would say, yeah, see, capitalism allowed those really, really bad guys to come in and do really bad stuff. Therefore, how can you go ahead and glorify it? Well, that's not exactly how it works, right? So the guy that makes the really, really high quality basketballs is now accountable to the community. It's his brand. It's his reputation. Therefore, that guy's never going to do anything to cheapen that brand because the brand is his value. The company that goes ahead and makes the best balls in mass volume knows what their value proposition is. They're going to go ahead and pump out best balls at a, at a larger volume, larger volume, larger volume, so they can constantly bring the cost down and they have their market. The people that are scamming people will never stay in business because people will wise up to the idea of look at what you're doing, now get out of here. Now, in the old days, get out of here had a name. Well, that was Brandon from down the block. He's a really bad person. We don't ever want to do business with Brandon down the block. Therefore, Brandon would think twice before ever doing such a scam because everyone knew who he was. Fast forward to where we are today, and I know you're thinking like, Anthony, where are you going with this? You have the advent of internet marketing. Now, internet marketing has been around for like 10, 15, 20 years, whatever the case may be. And it's always been like a little unfair, right? It's never been the devastation of community. So you would have, you would have say in 2008, um, let's say a basketball company, let's just do a basketball, right? Like I like Michael Jordan, love Kobe Bryant. So let's stick with basketball. So 2008, a basketball company says, I wanna sell basketballs to people that normally would not have, I would have never met, right? So they say to Facebook or Google or whomever and say, anyone that is searching in, I don't know, somebody that's searching in California that has liked something with basketball before we want to send them ads. Now, just because someone's in California is like basketball doesn't mean that they're going to buy a basketball from you. Maybe they just like Magic Johnson, right? He was a Laker, like Kobe Bryant. Maybe they just whatever, right? Those two, those two variables, those two data points are not enough to go ahead and guarantee conversions. For instance, what... What is more probable, person A or person B buying a basketball? Person A lives in California and likes the Lakers. Person B lives in California, likes the Lakers, played in basketball, all of his friends are in basketball. He's uh, a chartered member of the Kobe Bryant Memorial Foundation. Um, and, and, you know, go on, go on, go on. Because the more data points you have, the higher probability you have that that person's gonna buy the basketball. So when internet marketing started, it was very new. Like, okay, we have two data points now, we have three data points now, we have four data points. And the entire game of it was for companies like Google and Facebook and whatnot, can we, not WhatsApp, what and whatnot, how do we go ahead and build our algorithm to allow us to build the most efficient profile of the individual for what? so that we can go ahead and stand behind a certain probability that this person will buy that product, whatever the product may be, that when somebody says, hey, listen, I wanna sell basketballs, we know who our people are that will buy basketballs, so we can go ahead and bunch them up, sell them to that guy who sells basketballs, he's gonna pay us for that, he's gonna then market to those people, and hopefully we were right, and hopefully a bunch of them bought basketballs because now that person has two things, the basketball company. A, they have more money to invest and they have more confidence to invest it with us. Therefore, when that money comes into us, we can then uh, pour it into research and build and build and build until we have the best algorithm that can guarantee that if you go ahead and buy from us, we will get you people that buy basketballs. Cool. 
So take that and multiply it by 15 years and you are where we are today. So Facebook and Google and all of these companies, isn't it funny that they don't sell a product but they make trillions of dollars? Like, does anyone ever stop and think of that? It's like when you walk into a room and everyone's laughing and you go, what's the joke? It's you, you're the joke. That, that's why everyone else is laughing. When you're, when you're the individual who thinks you're the customer, that thinks you're the free customer, you're the product, you're what they're selling. So, and it's not that I'm sitting here saying Facebook and Google that they're such bad companies. In fact, they're really good companies, but they've been unobstructed. Remember when we were talking about capitalism a little while ago? Capitalism would step in in terms of government. There are laws that say you cannot be a monopoly. Anyone with an IQ over one knows that those companies are monopolies. But because those companies make so much money and what is their product that they're able to identify segments of the population that are going to predictably do a certain type of behavior with a relevant statistical you know, uh, truth behind it. Well, does that count as voting too? Like say for instance, I mean, these companies are so large that if somebody came out and said, hey, listen, I'm gonna go ahead and we're out of the truth, so we're gonna go ahead and vote uh, Google is a monopoly. Um, do you think all of a sudden they're gonna win an election? Do you think Google, I mean, you just heard in the 2020 elections, you can have whatever opinion you want, but I, I'm pretty sure that these companies played a hand in it, right? The nation's pretty 50-50 on everything to go ahead and move the population one or 2% kind of goes ahead and guarantees you a president, right? And I'm not speculating to anything past that. But if Google then knows to themselves, well, that guy, he wants to go ahead and call us a monopoly? Facebook goes, that guy, he wants to call us a monopoly? All right, um, what is he? Uh, he's a Democrat? Okay, whatever. Democrat, Republican, we don't really care. We like green, money. Okay, um, I need you to go through his messages. I need you to dig up some stuff on him. Let's go ahead and take a look at the borders of the, uh, uh, of the geography he governs. Let's go ahead and see which segments, which demographics voted which way, what, what, what issues are important to them, what is he against, so is he against guns? Okay, cool, whether he's for them or against them, we don't really care. Now that we know that he's against them, let's go find people that are for them, let's activate them, let's motivate them, let's put ads on their side that they need to go out and vote. The people that are against guns, let's go ahead and just tell them, ah, you know, let's put them in, actually, that's what we'll do, we'll put them in the blackout zone, they won't get any ads, and we'll make sure that those people don't talk to those people, but we'll also make sure that they don't congregate with each other, we'll make sure that they don't We'll make sure that they don't see anyone else with their point of view on their feed because we'll go ahead and make sure that they feel like they're by themselves, which will, which will really depress their you know, belief that that guy's gonna win, will motivate and activate those people. We'll even put ads around Uber, hey, we'll go ahead and drive you to the election for free. These guys, yeah, you know, they work mostly in, in movie theaters. Let's go ahead and call a movie theater person. Let's get a big offering, uh, a big new cinematic event. Let's have them push it up so that they, can, so that they can't get out of work. If you think I'm crazy, A, I am. I don't know why people don't believe that. I say it all the time. But secondly, that's how the world works. That's how the money works because that's the product that they have. Their product is the people. So anyone that goes against them, they make sure to take you out. Which, you know, somebody might say, well, Anthony, you're going against them. Mm, yes, but like secretly, like shh. Publicly, we're complimenting. Hey, Google, we love you. We think you're the best company in the world. We think you're the best. There's no search company better than you. But because you're a for-profit company, which is great, you make so much money. Oh my God, you guys are great, 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 great. But because you're so great, because you make so much money, you know, I hate to say it to you, local business kind of gets like, they can't compete with the budgets of the corporations. No, 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 no. We're not saying anything's bad about you. We're just saying, you know what? We're going to be a not-for-profit. We're not even. We're not even going to take money from them. We're just going to be a not-for-profit. Something that's completely crazy. Like, how can a company be not-for-profit? Not-for-profit can continue to be not-for-profit. No problem. Don't worry. We're, we're just. Gonna, you know them. They they have no money. They're like poor. You know, like they're 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 only ninety nine percent of the population. We'll take care of them. Okay. But Google's the best. 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 Okay. So what is it? What's the effect of what's happened? Right. So now you have local business. Okay, well, what's local business, right? Like, let's define some stuff. A local business is a business that's local to geography, has, an, has a defined population. Meaning, when you live in a small community, or any community, like a, like a city, right? Like, say there's 100,000 people, which is really, that's big, right? Like, let's, 
there's only 400 cities in this country over 50,000, but there's like 27,000 cities. So let's say you have 40,000, right? Still big, but not like super duper duper. Which by the way, is a real website that I own, super duper duper, because I love it. But that's a story for another day. So there's 40,000 people. Okay. Any business that is located in the heart or at least in the vicinity of that community is accountable to those 40,000 people. Why? Because location matters. If you're a porn shop in the middle of these 40,000 people, you might say, well, hey, it's, it's, it's legal. In fact, I wear pantyhose and, and, and I don't know what they sell there, right? Like I wear pantyhose and plaid skirts to breakfast with my family. Like that's what I do. That's what I love. Cool. Fine. God bless you. You can do it, right? But when the community who's taking their kids to like church and Sunday brunch have to walk down Main Street and see you wearing pantyhose and plaid skirts while with your kids eating breakfast, like on like a like a wooden table with a with a paddle, that's a problem. And it's not because you're doing anything illegal, but the community doesn't like it, which means as a business in a community, you have to be accountable to the community because you have a defined population. If you piss off, if you upset a percentage of that population, it exponentiates, right? So when you're in a community, everyone knows each other. So let's say this porn shop owner, um, hey, no one likes him to begin with, right? or her, right? Like equal equality. Uh, nobody likes the boy or the girl, whoever's owning him. And now all of a sudden, someone in the community got caught uh, being seen in there and they're like, oh, well, I blame Ted. Apparently Ted's a bad guy. Right? Like I blame Ted for being in that place, but if that place didn't exist, Ted would not have been um, motivated or persuaded or, 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 or would have went in there. All right, we need to get rid of that place. So if you rub a percentage, it can be a small percent the wrong way, guess what everyone in the community has? They know each other, it's their family, it's their friends. So 10 people, think about 10 school moms. And I love moms, my mom was a school mom. Nothing wrong with that, we have a child, my wife is a school mom, right? But school moms are the most amazing people in the world because they love their children so much that they're, if there's a bubblegum wrapper on the floor, they're telling someone, right? Like, and it's out of love, but it's like, to people that don't love your child, it's like, come on lady, you're annoying, right? But those 10 school moms are going, blah, 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 and they are Paul Revere times 1 million and 50,000, right? So if you are a business in a community, you need to be accountable as a community. Okay. So when someone's in business in a community, how can they be a successful business? Well, they have to be kind of like boring, right? Like, like if you have 40,000 people, you know, 10% love something extreme on one side, 10% love something extreme on the other side, 33% will never like what you do, 20% will love what you do, and then the other 20% you have to win over. And I'm not sure that only equals 100%, but don't get a calculator, right? And there's a 20% that you have to win over. That 20%, you go, okay, you know, we're going to make uh, hamburgers. Um, they have meat and, and cheese and, and lettuce and a tomato on a bun. All right, everyone likes that, right? Hamburger's cool. But we're gonna have like the, the super duper burger too. It's gonna have blue cheese broiled crumb on it. And the meat is going to be uh, made of uh, grade one filet mignon. And it's gonna be like a $20 burger. Well, that 20% you need to win, some of them have money. And they're like, oh, I'm gonna go there. Some of them don't. And at the end of the day, what you take a look at is how many customers you have, What's the average revenue per lifetime, the lifetime value of the customer? Take that all, divide it by your costs, and if, you're, if your customers bring in more money than you pay, God bless your successful business. But what are you gonna do to be successful? Again, you have to have the whole community like you. So can you be a successful business in a community by outsourcing your labor to China? I don't think so, I don't, how would that even work? You have, a, you have a building and then you have a bunch of TVs with Chinese people on it? Like, outsource Chinese labor on it. I don't think you could do that. I, I don't think you could go to a restaurant and your hostess is like, I'm not gonna do the accent, but like Zooming from China. Because the community would say, I really don't like that place. Yeah, they give me the best burger, but they're outsourcing to China. They're not even hiring with our own community. What, what do they think they're better than us? I'm not going to shop there. They don't even come to shop to me. They, you know, my child needs a job and they won't even give him a job because they found some little little whatever in India outsourcing that they could pay $2 an hour. And guys, that's me 
sarcastically pointing out how corporations take advantage of, of cheap labor, which some people would call slave labor like me. I don't, I don't think you should ever pay someone a dollar an hour, right? So let's get that straight. So to be a successful local business, you have inherent overhead. You have employees, you have to, if you're a successful business, you better have a 4th of July parade, right? Like you better buy the fireworks. There's overhead that you have to do to be a business owner, a successful one. But what's the benefit of it? You're a pillar of the community. Your children walk around with their head up. You bring in revenue into the community. You go ahead and give jobs. You go ahead and offer influence on, on lives. You go into the school board and people listen to you. You say who you think is a good congressman or senator and people listen to you, which means those congressmen and senator have to go ahead and get you to, they have to, they have to get, seek your approval. The school board has to seek your approval. The children that, uh, that trust you, their parents need to like you to go ahead and allow their child to go ahead and go to your place of business. So if you're a pillar of the community, there's responsibilities that go with it. And the sacrifices you make is you're not really running the most profitable business. You're running the business that allows your legacy to live on, that your local community is independent because your community is allowed to grow with a culture that is unique to them, that's built by the best of the community. That's local community. And that was always okay. Like, I think that's pretty cool. And in 2006, 2007, that was kind of easy to continue doing, even though, you know, Ted's basketball shop is sending ads in. They're really generic. They're broad. Uh, they, they don't know who in the community is buying basketballs. They don't know the price of the, of the basketballs in the community. Um, they, don't know, they don't know stuff to go ahead and target it because the community has a bit of a force field, right? Like, I don't know who you are sending me an ad to buy basketball. I know where I get them. I like those people. I'm not doing business with you on this internet thing, and I got to put a cart. In. Not interested, right? A shipping and handling. Not interested. I'll just I'll go down the block. That's where everyone goes. Fast forward to where we are today, and the data set of these companies is ridiculous. It's it's unfair, and I'm actually saying unfair because it is unfair. So for instance, now you're accustomed, like say you bought a basketball from some company a while ago, right? And it's, it's in your local business, um, in your local community. Did you post about it somewhere? Were you seen playing basketball? Did someone say, hey, cool basketball, where did you get it? Did someone message you and say, hey, you got a new basketball, let's go? Did it happen a year ago? What month did it happen in? Um, what team is your favorite team? What friends of yours play basketball? Is there, is it, will you guys all go together? Is there a particular activity you guys like doing together? How much was that basketball? And when you know all of that stuff, you can then look at that data as a person selling a basketball from another town. And I can send you an ad a week before you norm, the, the week before that you did buy the basketball, I can send the same ad to all of your friends that you play basketball with. I know the price you bought it at, so I can undercut the price. And I can say, hey, if you could find one or two people to, to, to get in this order with you, we'll give you a 20% discount on the order. Plus, we'll send you um, a free Michael Jordan jersey. The kid or whoever's like, oh my God, I, I love Michael Jordan. This is an offer. This is an offer of a lifetime. Michael, Ted, Vin, Christian, like, talk to me. Let's, let's get in. So everyone gets so excited, their adrenaline's going there. They're, they don't even know what they're doing and they go ahead and buy from that company. It's a, it's a great offer, why not? Well, where did the money, where was the money going to go? To the local business that always gets it. Is the local business going to be able to bring down their overhead in any feasible way to go ahead and offset what you just did? No, they still have to pay the labor, the workers. They're still gonna do the arts and craft shows and the fireworks shows. They're still going to do all that, but the money that they are banking on, because there's a, I guess an unspoken contract, but there's a, there's a unity and community. Oh, unity. Is there a unity and community? I think there might be, but there's a, somebody write that down for me. There is a unity and, huh, there's a unity and community that everyone is a partner together. 
that one person can't just say, hey, listen, we're still going to go to your events. We're going to make sure you do the fireworks because if you don't do the fireworks, now we're going to start talking behind your back. Like, oh, I guess he couldn't do it this year. Things aren't that good. Oh, he's finally coming off his high horse. Yeah, I heard this. I heard that. I heard this. That you don't allow that to happen, that you stay united in what you do. But no one sees that at the moment. It's just kids buying your basketball. So the money that they would have spent at that local business now goes to poof. I don't know where it goes. It's some company, some, some ads, I don't know. So how is that company able to go ahead and, 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 and give that price, right? Like, how do they know all that stuff? Well, they have no employees. They have no inventory. They have no overhead. They have no manufacturing. It's some dodo in front of a computer with a whole bunch of money in his hand because investors gave him the money or he's been doing this for so long or it's the marketing budget of the company he works for. And he gets to go ahead and try out thousands of different ads all a different way. And you know what? He's not confined to geography, to population. He's not accountable to anybody. He or she is not accountable to anybody because their ads are global. So they say, okay, let's say that, this say, let's say that, this say, let's see who bites on them. When they start biting on it, let's take those, let's scale it up, let's do a couple of variations of them. What kind of variables do we need? What kind of personal effects do we need? Bop, 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 bop. And when they're all done, the basketball that the local business uh, sold, you know, when you factor in labor and overhead and being a pillar of the community and, and kind of being like a decent person, uh, probably there's like a, a $2 worth of cost in there, right? And he sells it for three bucks. The basketball that we sold by that person has none of that. There's maybe like 20 cents worth of cost. They could sell it for a dollar, make five times on their money while undercutting that person by 33%. So where's the money going to go? Well, dumb. And now because no individual person looks at anything and says, all right, well, I'm directly blowing up my entire community, they continue and continue and continue. At some point, those businesses no longer have the ability it's live. Okay, cool. All well, the updates are live. Sorry. That local business no longer has the update. Uh, update. No longer has the ability to stay open any longer. So they don't. They close. And they cry to their mommy and, you know, business wasn't good. And, and the people that they have, lay, have to lay off are really upset. Nobody saw it coming. Because I can tell you as a business owner, the number one thing that keeps me up at night is ever not being able to take care of the people that make up Rhino. And I put myself at the bottom of that list. I could be like, I don't want to be too dramatic, but I could be laying on the floor somewhere, but if everyone else is taken care of, I'm laying on the floor happy. Like, it's just, that's who we are. So that business goes down. The next business goes down, right? Like, I don't need to give you every example. People sell basketballs and baseballs or whatever. Go down one by one by one. Who fills in those voids? Well, you have the government and you have one party that has no problem bribing everyone. All right, uh, we're going to have them print more money. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to stimulus packages. It's those people. They're bad. They're bad. And it's always kind of like you versus them. You're in this position because they did this to you. So vote me and I'm going to give you this. And we have 30 trillion in national debt, right? So it's like they've been doing this for a while. I don't think any politician is anything better than just bribery. Like if you vote me, I'll, I'll, I'll put this package through and then we'll have inflation to 9%. But they're stupid. They, they don't know what inflation is. Don't worry about it. Um, and stuff like that. So who fills those uh, roles is government comes in and tries to tries to campaign on that they could be the solution with stimulus and that type of stuff, tax the rich, stuff like that. But then corporation, who literally just put them out of business, is like, well... They did have a good business, but I knew who all their I knew who all their customers were because I purchased the data of their customers. I knew what their customers were buying for them, so I went ahead and undercut all their prices. So actually, those customers are now mine. So how about I come in there? I'll open a little shop. I don't really care. I have one in like Tahiti and Malaysia and, and Antarctica. It doesn't matter. I open them anyway. I'll open a shop. Okay, let's get some like fifteen an hour booger picker kid that is. We'll call we'll call him the office manager. Okay, and then all the people that are recently unemployed. Go hire them because they're desperate. They need jobs. Like, what are they going to do? And then the government's like, I can't give you unemployment. You, you, have, you have jobs ready. Well, the corporation made a deal with the government that they're going to come in tax-free to go ahead and revitalize the community. And now you're not allowed to collect unemployment because you have jobs that you're available to get. So what do you do? You work a nine to five and maybe you get a half hour lunch. And everyone looks back and they go, how did this happen? Like, how did this happen? How did we not see this happen? And what I'm trying to say is 
it's all right in front of us. Like it's, it's right, it's happening right now. So the goal has always been to that first sentence of how do you value population? Because the reality is back in the day, like everyone would get like pitchforks and like off with her head. You can't do that no more. There's like laws against doing that type of stuff. Nor do you, we think you should actually do that stuff, right? Like I'm, I'm joking, like you should not do that. But what it told you was their strength in numbers. I was the oldest of six boys. I beat every single one of my brothers up every time. And my mother used to always tell them, guys, if you would just like team up, you could beat him. My second brother, Chris, went to the army. That my third brother could have went to the army. Like they were big. I, I was the shortest of the three oldest, right? And I was the oldest. But I would never allow them to gather. I would say, hey, Chris, Joey said this about you. Yeah, let's go get him. I have your back. Let's go get him. And then the next day I would do the same thing to the other one. So that as long as they never gathered, and as long as they believed that I was the one that like uh, had the, the golden whatever, right? Like I had the what I had the staff to go forward. <sighs> golden staff, that sounds so silly. Then they were always they were always dependent on me because they never had the ability to gather by themselves. It's like psych 101. Don't let the people gather if you're going to take advantage of them. So when you hear politicians come up, oh, you're in this position because this person did it to you. No, they didn't. I don't know that person. I don't think anyone thinks, oh, Anthony's white, so I don't think anyone thinks, oh, this person's black, so that doesn't exist in real world. It only exists if you sit there and you allow yourself to get brainwashed to it. Because I can promise you, if you take a look at your son and you take a look at someone else's son and you put them in a park, you know what they do? They play together. So everything else is just noise. No one grows up like that. And I gotta tell you, I'm sensitive to the, to the journey of certain people. And I'm not saying any particular demographic because there's not just one that got taken advantage of. Right? Like there's a lot. And I understand that many years ago, uh, it might have been really bad, not might have, but it was. I just don't believe that today, if you're a newborn and you're living a life that does not have those memories, that you see the same thing. Like for instance, if I grew up and every time I walked into a store, someone punched me in the face. Every time I walk into a store, I would look around. I would always think someone's gonna punch me in the face. But if I was just born, I would never have known someone punched me in the face, so I would never think of it. Therefore, unless I'm told of it, I would never even think of it. And then when I'm told of it, I'm now looking for it, right? Like that's the way that works. So I'm not saying the world is perfect, right? Like we're sitting here trying to reinvent it, but I just don't think that your neighbor's your enemy. I, I just don't. I think if um, like aliens come down, your neighbor and you are going to run into the same basement and be like, all right, you get that door, I got this door. I just think that's the way it is. Um, so rather than talking about aliens taking over the world, which probably would be a good thing right now, um, how do we go ahead and combat what we just described? Which I think is fairly logically laid out. It sounds like I think I'm, well, I am crazy, right? So it's twofold. What Rhino Retirement is, is the ability to finally offer universal income. Because the, the wealth is in the people. It always has been. So these giant corporations that are like worth like a quadrillion dollars, if they lost their customers, you know how much they'd be worth? Minus a quadrillion, not zero, minus a quadrillion because the amount of debt they take on, the amount of liabilities, the, the, amount, of the amount of everything would make them negative. Walmart would actually go bankrupt, have to sell off every one of their big properties. You know what happened? Those super centers would become town centers, right? Like I think somebody in the town knows how to sell shirts. I'm pretty sure someone in the town knows how to sell toothbrushes. In fact, I don't think you could name one thing that Walmart actually makes themselves that somebody with under a fifth grade degree couldn't make themselves. Exactly, but the Walton family receives like, I think like $200 million a day in dividends because they own the stock that enslaves everyone with it. Sorry, Walmart, if you're watching, my apologies. Um, so the name of the game is, well, if people had the opportunity to have a belief in small business again, would that reverse the flow of funds coming from community to corporation back from corporation to community? 
right? Like if I, if I had the choice, hey, Anthony, you're gonna buy a basketball. Would you like to buy it from your neighbor who has a basketball store? It's four bucks. Or would you like to buy it from, I don't know, this, this corporation that's like, it's just a kid and he has a budget and he's sending you ads because he bought your data. Or would you like to buy it from him for $3? Before you make that decision, the $4 in the community is 33% more, but the money actually goes back into where you're living and you're able to go ahead and do your part and allowing everyone for the freedom of independence. Or you could be completely self-centered, buy it from the booger picker for $3, and you could save a dollar to go get like a lemonade from that girl and maybe take two because she's like five years old, right? Which would you do? I know that was really sillily presented, fun, but the point is if given the equal choice and it has, it has no labor on my part, nothing I have to do differently, I'm just simply like, I'll press this or this, I'm always, going to go ahead and take care of my community first. And if I was so selfish to believe I shouldn't take care of my community first, well, remember all those like, those like school moms that like tell everyone, I would be terrified to not buy it from my, my community. And everyone know that I bought the best that says made in China because I wanted to save that dollar. In fact, no one in my community would even like me. So if all things being equal, I would always do this. Well, that's a big sentence, right? Like if all things equal, we just described how it's like a quadrillion dollar business to go ahead and take these sales from you. So how can you do anything about it? Yeah, Anthony, I, I, I like Google. In fact, I love search engines. In fact, I'm never going to use anything in the search engine ever again. Search engines are the best and they are just, I, I just, you know, why wouldn't I? I agree. They change the world. You can't like... It's like a Chris Rock skit where he was talking about how guys never go back on the way they kiss a girl, right? Like I'm, I'm purposely being very generous with that language, but girls never go back on the uh, standard of living. So for instance, and he's making a joke, right? So if a girl is dating a boy and they're constantly taking the bus everywhere, that's what she knows, the bus. But the next time she dates a guy and he has a car, she's like, I'm never dating a guy without a car. Like, this is such a great thing to do. Um, and so forth and so forth. Well, it's the same thing. Where was I, by the way? I was talking about... I completely forgot where I was. But talking about the community. Um, oh, okay. Search engines, right? Like, once you use them, you're never going to go back. It's not like oh, I've used a search engine, but now I'm going to go back to the yellow pages. I'm going to go back to calling 401. I'm going to go back to like calling my friends or texting them. Hey, do you know what? No, they're here to stay. So if search engines are here to stay, which they should be, I love search engines, then it's simply like brushing your teeth, right? Like you just need to change the toothpaste. I'm always going to use a search engine, but if I don't want to use Google anymore and I want to use Rhino, it's pressing the button. I could just, okay, cool. That makes sense. All right, well, why would I ever use Rhino? What the hell, what's Rhino? Well, while I'm doing this stuff, there's things that I've learned. I've learned a lot. Um, I love Rhino Street. I think it's like a $1 trillion idea and I'm going to go with it. But nobody else really believes me. Let me take that back. It's not that no one believes it, but it's not self it's not, uh, it's not immediate gratification, right? So when someone says, all right, Ant, Rhino Street, I, you know, Anthony, I think you're the smartest person in the world. I wanna, let's do it, Rhino Street, what do I do? Okay, we'll go on Rhino Street and list your business. Okay, now go ahead and recommend other people's businesses and they'll send them an email and then they can do it. And uh, the, the emails have your actual data, they have access to the database dynamically. <sighs> Anthony? That sounds great. Like, just tell me what to do. List your business. Okay. Well, now what? Well, you, you gotta like share it with the community and tell other people. Wait, so, uh, no, no, but you're empowered to. You can bring a whole community on. But what if they, what if they don't? Well, oh, right? Like, what do you do? All right, Anthony, I really wanna do it, but okay, all right. I'm only gonna use Rhino Street. Only gonna use Rhino Street. All right. 
Hair salon, uh, no search results. Okay. Uh, pizza, no search results. Okay. And, and I, I don't know. Um, uh, basketball, no search results. Anthony, I love this, but I can't use it. There's, there's no results anywhere. Well, if you just, that's when you realize, like, stop running into a wall. Just stop. You cannot tell the market what to do. The market will tell you what to do. And the market has told me very clearly that nobody has an interest in building Rhino Street when it doesn't offer them any type of immediate gratification at the moment. It does not offer them anything that changes their life at the moment. That it has to be popular, it has to be buzzing, or they have to have a really good reason or a really easy way of entering it for them to populate it. But when they do populate it, what is Rhino Street? Well, five years, it's been custom coded. It identifies user location, of course, they ask their permission. And then upon you uh, typing anything, it only shows you the results of a 20 mile radius around you because it then calculates all the latitude and longitudes of your exact location plus 20 miles in a circumference radius diameter of high. And those are the results. And on top of that, because it's a nonprofit, and I don't mean the tax. I don't mean tax talk. It's not listed as a nonprofit because government, when you list, I don't know if anyone's ever done. When you list nonprofit, you don't get taxed on anything. So the government, like, literally, um, so did you not buy, uh, you bought gum today. Where'd you buy it from? How'd you get the money, right? Not interested. I'll pay tax, don't care. Um, so it's a nonprofit, right? Not in, not in legal definition, meaning we don't collect any ad revenue. We don't sell any, uh, sell any ads. We don't sell any marketing services. We do not retain any client data. And it's completely coded to be global. There is not a zip code in the world that it does not um, that it does not mesh with, right? You could be in Antarctica, you could be in Malaysia, you could be in like CW blah 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 Canada, where they have letters for whatever reason. You could be anywhere you want, and when you put the zip code in, it identifies exactly where you are and allows you to search your community first. Because if there's no ads and there's no marketing and there's no client or user data retention and there's no corporate that are able to buy their way into listings, then what is your listings? You're just a person that is searching the 20 miles around you. So in fact, if you want to search global, use Google. If you want to search local, use Rhino. You know what? I always use Google, but I use Rhino first because I search my community first. These are sentences you can hear. They, they make sense. It's not like I'm like, I know, Anthony, you agreed, I agreed, we all agreed, you're crazy but I'm, I'm crazy like a fox, right? Like that makes sense to me. But how do we get that there? We have to populate it. Well, Anthony, didn't we just talk about how like nobody wants to populate your search engine? Yes, I remember. So let's just put that on hold. Well, let's agree on one thing, right? If Google's worth 1.5 trillion and we are literally the antithesis, we are coded and built and structured and proprietary and owned and everything is ours exactly 100% opposite of Google. Are we worth something too? At the very least, if you're 100% opposite of something, then you're a one-to-one -one choice, right? Like when I go ahead and think about who I want to kiss, I see a boy and I see a girl. Despite recent uh, scientific like whatever, you know where I'm going with this, they're opposite. I have a clear choice what to pick. And I'm old enough to remember when that clear choice was quite clear. Now, not so much, but you get the point, right? Pen or pencil, paper or plastic, rhino or Google. The point being when you're such a clear difference, a clear opposite, then you're called a competitor because it's either them or them. Nobody would ever use you both at the same time because you do everything opposite. Now, what's the opposite? Global and local. Well, we just kind of went over this. If you ask anyone and you're able to offer an equal but opposite choice that allows you just to press the button, change the toothpaste, would people go ahead and search local first? I think so. In fact, unless everyone's just blowing smoke up my, my coolie, Everyone agrees with it. In fact, people agree to the point that they would even spend more money to go ahead and give it to their community. So if Google's worth 1.5 trillion, I gotta tell you, I'm really, really of the belief that we're worth like at least 10%, right? 150 billion is a big number. I don't like saying it, but it's global. It's, a, it's not like we built something that only works in New Jersey. Like I'm really quite 
not proud, pride go before the fall, but I'm quite pleasant. It's a pleasure to be able to own that, right? And we all own it together. So let's put that on the back burner. Rhino retirement. Again, universal income. Rhino retirement has two assets, Rhino Street. Anthony, I know, stop talking about Rhino Street. Rhino Bucks. Now what's Rhino Bucks? Rhino Bucks is the payment method that we're able to go ahead and secure that universal income and give it to you. Well, how does that work, right? So Rhino Bucks, I hate saying cryptocurrency. I feel like that's such a like a poor like, like connotation. Like crypto, oh, you're one of those. Because there's so many scam artists out there. Like the most disgusting dirtbags I've ever seen. They're like, hey, if you do this, uh, buy. No. So it's a digital currency. It's a, let's just call it crypto, right? Like stop getting fancy. So cryptocurrency, there's one billion in supply and it's on a smart contract. That's it. No, nothing ever more. Poof. One billion in supply. It's allowed to have 16, well, not allowed. It has 16 decimal points. So it can be divisible, like, I don't know, 16 to the 10th power, that way the decimal point, right? It can be divisible really, really small. And in doing so, that's the total supply. Now, the great thing about Rhino, in fact, I was speaking to, uh, well, I guess she would allow me to, Caro, who most of you know, she's from Zimbabwe. She's now in the UK and I was on the phone with her, well, the Zoom. And I said this to her, I go, what company in the world or crypto company, I guess are we call the crypto company now, I don't know, uh, can go ahead and raise a bunch of money through investors by, uh, by selling them the, the coin, right? At like one cent, two cent, three cents. Actually, I was on phone with someone last night who got in in December, 2021 at one cent, right? But anyway, I was like, can I please buy that back from you? She was like, no, I was like, come on. Um, but yeah. Uh, what crypto company can go ahead and sell a whole bunch of investment coin so that they can finance where they're going. And then when they go ahead and do the launch, they say, hey, guys, I'm not giving you any of the coin yet uh, because we need to build the market. But listen, I'm, I'm going to show you what we're doing. But please, please, please allow me to do this and trust me. I was like, that's unheard of. Like, who are, like, and she goes, Anthony, we know you at this point. Like, you're there. Like, like you're there, like we can see you. You've, you've never dodged a call, you never dodged an email. In fact, I think someone actually told me to take them off their email list because I just finished emailing everyone who didn't get into Rhino Retirement that are investors who have, a, who have an actual ownership interest in it, which is baffling to me, um, for a fifth email, right? And that's fine. I have, I really have no problem being told no, I, I don't. If I'm doing something and what I believe to be the most logical, ethical, and moral thing for someone, they can tell me no a million times. And again, not in the bedroom, right? Like no means no. But they can tell me no a million times and I'm going to do it with them dragging, kicking, and screaming because I know I'm going to an outcome where they're going to be like, oh, thank you. I, I didn't see that coming, but good job, Ian. Cool. I like that, right? So because I'm able to hold the coin back of all the investors, Rhino has the one billion supply. Like we own the one billion, it's ours. Nobody has any supply. So when somebody goes ahead and buys Rhino coin, which is really Rhino box, it's the same exact thing, but I just like saying Rhino coin, so stick with me. But if you do buy Rhino coin, it is for like the Rhino foundation somewhere, which we're totally cool with, right? Like buy it, good for you. Um, but if, I guess we should say Rhino box, right? Rhino box. So if someone buys Rhino Bucks on the market, there is no Rhino Bucks to sell except from Rhino. Therefore, Rhino dictates the price, right? Like if you're going to buy a house, who dictates price, you or the seller? The seller says, hey buddy, it's my house and this is the price of it. Now you might say, well, there's a bunch of houses over there and you could kick rocks, I'll go to another house. But what if they're the only house on the, in the state, what if they're the only house in the whole country? Then you kind of got to buy it at their price. Welcome to Rhino, right? Like that's what it is. So we are able to set the price. The opening price will be $1. Now, the thing that no one's ever done before, which is what we're really excited for. Now, I gotta take a step back a little bit. Like I have a good financial background, everybody knows that. But more so than that, to go ahead and get uh, to the point where you equal an Anthony, I can't even tell you what my life has looked like. Like it's been like, if I told you even half of it, you're like, oh my God, how would you not like jump out a window? And I would say, I tried, but I sprained my life. Not a true story, right? Like 
I'm here. But you have to go through enough where you all of a sudden like believe that there's something bigger, right? Like that you that you represent something. And the fact that you're blessed to go ahead and have the thoughts that you have that so logically are able to look around the corner per se and see what's going on, that you now have responsibility to those that you can save to save. In fact, I almost think I'm a superhero. And I think that sounds crazy with Anthony. Yeah, that guy at Rhino thinks he's a superhero. He tells everyone's a superhero. Well, how do you become a superhero, right? Like you have to do something super. Does that mean you're not a superhero while figuring out how to do it? So I don't know. I could either be wrong or just kind of uh, early, right? Like talking about stocks. But I just, that's what I kind of feel. So I don't ever do anything with me in mind. I don't ever do anything where I'm like, okay, I can do it like this and I can make a whole bunch of money here. In fact, in our business plans for Rhino, I always say to people, I go, well, I'm going to have, I have like 47% of the company. Rhino owns 100 million coin. I have 47 million coin. I could use that to fund the company. And people are like, did you not realize that like that's your money? It's not company money. Like that's your ownership of everything you put together. And I'm like, but I own Rhino. Like I don't get it. And they're like, you're not really good at this whole like, like you really think you're Rhino. I'm like, oh, duh. So anyway, that was a silly story. The point being, to go ahead and do what I'm about to say, you have to have that mentality. So because we have the one billion coin. And because we're holding off anyone from having any of that billion coins so that they can't supply the market, right? Like they can't sell it. Anyone that buys it is, is increased demand versus no supply, right? Because we are the supply. So we're able to put the price of the dollar. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> now, because we make the price and we're able to hold off the market, well, the, the investors, that everyone, everyone that bought coin, right? we're able to dictate the price of that coin going forward because we're the only seller. You see, when you're the only seller, you make the price. You are the market. When there are other sellers, you, you are not the market. You have to compete with them, in which case they say, I'm not gonna, you know, you wanna sell for $10? Well, I want customers, I'm gonna sell for $9. And then you're like, well, if you sell for nine, I'm gonna sell for eight. And you guys come down to the best price that allows you the some type of profit and allows people to buy the product from you. That's called an efficient market. What we're doing is a monopoly. That's what it is. We're the only owner. So no one can tell us anything. So we go from $1 to $1 one penny to $1 two penny and one cent every day thereafter for infinity. And, well, not infinity. I'll tell you when infinity ends. And what that does is it goes ahead and creates a performance. It creates an appreciation. It creates something that's stable, consistent, and profitable that people then say, whoa, I've never seen anything like that before. I can buy it and get guaranteed a profit. I want to get in. Let me get in. In which case you would say to yourself, well, Anthony, that sounds like a complete Ponzi scheme. Like, yeah, it goes up when people are buying. and When they don't buy, it goes down. I agree with you. But you have to put all the pieces together, right? Like, that's not what this is. So any market... Like, remember Shibu coin and like Doge coin? Everyone was buying them and there was like a quadrillion amount of coin. The problem with everyone buying it was that when everyone bought it, they bought it. All the buys were in it. So the market can, get, can then go ahead and predict when all the buying has been exhausted. So, for instance, if I only have $1,000 and you only have $1,000 and you only have $1,000, we take all $1,000 and put it into a coin. Well, we have no more money to put in. So... What are we going to do? We, we, we can't buy it any higher. Uh, when someone sells, we're like, oh, darn, what are we going to do? So then we have to sell to get our money back. So instead of ever asking anyone, again, from Rhino Retirement's point of view, hey, um, uh, hey, Bill, who I love, he's watching, he's in Brazil. Hi, Bill. Um, why don't you go ahead and give us $10,000? We really need it. And maybe Bill would say yes. Like, I don't know what that negotiation would look like, but I suspect Bill would say, okay, uh, I can't do 10,000, or maybe he can, but I, I could do 2,000, right? Like 3,000, whatever the case may be. And we would say, okay, he would take that 2,000, he'd buy 2,000 worth of Rhino Bucks, and it's over. The market went up a little bit because he bought it. But what's next? I don't know. What happens next? 
And that's been the problem with all the different crypto scams. They're all based on the greater fool theory that if I buy this, that's absolutely worth nothing. I still believe there's influences, influences and stuff and marketing behind it that we could get other people to buy it for the same reason I did. I bought it knowing it's worth nothing, but it's going to go higher because some other idiot or greater fool is going to buy it. Blah, 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 blah. And then when you run out of fools, so instead of saying to Bill, hey, uh, 2000, send it over right away, we say, okay, Bill, you're, you're going with 2000, cool. All right. Can you do $25 a week times I don't know, 80 weeks uh, for that $2,000? And he's like, well, for that, I could probably do 5000 In fact, for $25 a week, I could do that forever. Like, I, I'm, a, I'm an adult, I, I have money. And I would say, well, that'd be great. You can opt out anytime you want, but if you can do 25 hours a week, that would be perfect. And Bill's like, yeah, sure, I would love to do that. So what did we do? Not only did we turn 2,000 into a much larger number, because 25 hours a week is, is I don't wanna say nothing, right? Like it's, it's money, but it's less than 2,000 coming out all at once. But what did we, but also what do we do? We have scheduled demand, right? So like Bill buys the $25 today, he didn't disappear. We know because we have like a, a calendar and we have a calculator and we go, okay, on the calendar, let's write one week from today, Bill's gonna buy another 25. And then let's get the calculator because three other people are buying that day for 25. So three times 25 is 75. All right, so we know one week from today, $75, no matter what is going to get bought because it's already scheduled to be bought. Cool. Um, take that number and make it higher. Right? You have 10 people, you have 20 people, you have 100 people, you have 1,000 people, you have 10,000 people, all doing the same thing. Now, mind you, when you take a look at the amounts in random retirement, they're purposely low. It's 1, 10, 25. Well, it is 25, but I charge 20. Um, I'm going to send out an email tomorrow or the next day just to get your permission to correct that. If you want to say a 20, God bless, but everyone did it, think like you pressed 25 and then you were surprised to see 20. So, I hope everyone's okay with that. But I will ask permission, obviously. So it's one, 10, 25, and 100. So what if someone says, Ann, I, I want to do 1,000. I, I have a lot of money, and I think this is a good idea. No. What do you mean, no? No. This is why I'm sending out all those emails that are making people lose their mind, which, by the way, I'm losing my mind. In the interest of Rhino, I am not allowing any one person unfair representation because the structure and foundation of Rhino not only is very democratic, but it needs to be complete grassroots because if everyone is participating, then that's a good thing. So say for instance, Rhino is doing a million dollars in, in purchases every week. Is that good or bad? Now, before you answer that question, there's a question you need to ask me. Is that million dollars? How many people are doing it? Because if one person is doing a million dollars. Are you comfortable being in Rhino anymore? What if that one person dies? What if they What if they just leave? The whole company goes to nothing. What if that million was being done by eight hundred thousand people? Like eight hundred thousand people are doing like I don't know a dollar and a quarter a piece. Well, you would say, wait, and eight hundred thousand people are, are doing a dollar and a quarter a piece per week. Those people are never leaving. It's a dollar and a quarter. Why would they ever leave? It's a dollar and a quarter. Exactly. So which million dollars is stronger? Well, that one. Therefore, if we're going to build something that's going to last the test of time and we're going to watch Anthony lose it in mind doing it, I might as well do it the correct way. Let's go get everyone in at low dollar amounts because that's what makes us stronger. Okay. So play it out with me, right? So everyone that's in random retirement is on a plan purposely so that we can go ahead and schedule and ensure that we have scheduled demand. Because when you have scheduled demand, that whole question about Bill before, he goes into 2000 and then what happens never comes up. Anthony, I see Rhino coin went up like 20 bucks last week. Um, is that a top? Like, do you think it's gonna go up any further? Well, I don't know, Bill, and not that Bill, right? Like, I don't know, Chris, let me, let me take a look. What do you mean take a look? How do you how do you, how are you able to take a look and tell me what it's going to do next week? Really easily. Let me tell you. All right, my calculator. We have uh, $5 million uh, dollars 
to buy next week. Um, and it's been growing at 5% a week. So $5 million times 5%, so I think it's like 5.1 million, right? Like something like that. $5.1 million is scheduled to be bought next week. Cool. Um, but yeah, how many people are gonna sell? I don't know, let's find out. Over the last six weeks, we've had an average selling of $116,000. 116,000, that's like nothing. I know. Well, why, don't you think people are gonna sell at some point? I don't know. Why do you think it's so low? Because it only goes up. Why would anyone sell? Well, Anthony, you're, it only goes up because people don't sell. Well, that's a chicken or the egg conversation, right? So, uh, but 116,000 will probably sell. We have a 5% increase, 5% of 116,000 comes out to roughly 122,000. So we have 5 million that's gonna be bought, 122,000 is gonna be sold. 5 million divided by 122,000 is roughly, I don't know, one and a quarter. All right, let's call, let's say it's 200,000. That equals 20, no, 25. So demand divided by supply equals roughly 25. Anthony, the coin's only $3, so how did you get 25? Well, I, I divided it all. But Anthony, the coin's only $3. You're telling me it's worth 25. No, you're missing the point. All of our investors have been waiting to get paid. Well, if I have 200,000 that's gonna be sold and I have 5 million that's gonna be bought, that means I have 4.8 million that they can sell and the coin will not change value at all. It'll be one. Oh, no, no, it'll stay exactly where it is because there's no new, uh, no new sales versus no new buys. They're all, they're all canceled out. But Ant, you said you wanted to increase a penny a day. Yeah, so, all right, guys, not 4.8 million, but you 4.7 million. All right, $4.7 million worth. Here you guys go. Um, I wouldn't sell if I was you, but it's your money. Like, congratulations, you got in at one penny. It's now three and a half dollars. Like, I hope you're happy. Okay, cool, right? So that's how that works. All right, so that's how, all right, so that's how the coin moves up. That's how investors get paid. Now here's, so I'm just trying to catch myself. So here's the coolest part, right? Now, because we've made the process, so I'll tell you this, a lot of my experience in life, especially marketing and stuff, is how do you go ahead and put the clearest message, which I'm terrible at, but make it the easiest, which I'm really good at, right? Like I take a look at everything from the user experience and say, how do I go ahead and simplify this? Okay. So a lot of people don't get into crypto because they're like, ah, crypto, it's, I gotta buy this. I gotta send the money here. I gotta do this, blah, 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 blah. I, nah, nah, not interested. And, and for good reason, because while you're doing all that, there's like scam artists around every corner. So we went the lengths of partnering with Stripe, which by the way, I don't mean like, oh, we, we, we're a customer there, so you know we're a partner with them. No, like we've actually been in contact with them and we have full access to the developers uh, package and program because we have a full team of developers. In fact, the grind of retirement that you're going through is completely custom coded, which is why you've had some bugs, which is why you shared with me, and which is why when the call started, I read my notification, everything's live. I hope those bugs are done. And we also went ahead and, oh, good. And we also went ahead, uh, to Monica, I got your email. Um, we also went ahead, and this isn't partnering with Binance, we're using their services, but we built a coin on the Binance blockchain because they're the largest exchange in the entire world. And we believe that they're the safest, right? That makes sense, they're the largest, why not be the safest, right? So this is how it works. So by opting into Rhino Retirement for $1, $10, $25, $100, that comes out of your account every week. That money then goes to Rhino. Immediately, there's a bot that we coded that take that money, bring it over to, we're doing it through PancakeSwap because it's really easy to registration. Um, and then we just build market cap and then we could go on the larger ones, right? Like, so we just need to build our way there. But it then takes it over to PancakeSwap, purchases your allotment of coin, then brings it back to the coin address that you give us, because we're giving everyone the freedom to have their own wallet, which I have not asked anyone yet, so you're not behind. I still need to do that. And that coin goes to your wallet. This will all be done, we believe, September 14th. I've really been saying September 14th. It might be September 21st, but that will not stop the actual market from working. It'll just, it'll just um, halt you getting that coin, right? And everyone that's in run of retirement gets that coin. The only coin that's being held is everything before run of retirement. That coin is yours to buy and sell and do whatever you want with, right? 
So to anyone, like uh, those school moms or whatever, to go ahead and be able to purchase an asset, a crypto one too, that only goes up by simply just pressing one button and then never doing anything again, sorry, um, is quite appealing. And it's in within a community of a whole bunch of other people all doing low amounts together. Here's the key to everything I just said. So you would say, all right, Ant, it buys a coin. What price is by the coin at, right? Like the devil's in the details. Like it, you, you just went over that. Like, uh, it buys the coin and is, is someone gonna ask like what the price of the coin is? Here's the thing. And this is where it gets a bit philosophical. It doesn't matter. So it buys it at market price, whatever price the coin is, it doesn't matter. Now you would never say that in the stock market, you would never say, okay, just buy that stock for me no matter what price it is I want it because the stock is a company. They have earnings as an actual measurement. They have a limit to what they can be worth. So the philosophical part is that we're saying Rhino Bucks has no limit to what it could be worth because what is it? It's a median of allowing universal income to the people that all are gathering together to participate together. And the amount that they're sending over, the one, the 10, the 25, 100, where's that number coming from? Like, uh, where's it come from? The person says, oh, I could do five. You know why they can do five? Because they're budgeting in their head, maybe without even knowing it. All right, I, I spend $300 a week. I, I only need to, you know, 250 of it is obligation. The other $50 I, I spend on going out to dinner. Um, I could cook maybe one day a week so that I could go ahead and afford to do this $5 investment because this makes sense to me. So what did that person really do? They invested a percentage of their transactions. Now that gets to a bigger story, transactions. What are transactions worth? Well, who cares about transactions? Well, transactions are what everyone's after. So when we talk about Google and Facebook with those super advanced algorithms, it's not because they're looking to get you they don't care about you, they want your transactions. The reason why their customers go ahead and purchase the product, which is you from them, is not because you're a pretty girl with blonde hair, it's because they know that there's a 97% certainty that when they buy a thousand of you pretty girls with blonde hair, that X amount of you will go ahead and buy the product that they're looking for. It's tested and it's, it, it's, 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 it's statistical proof. So they're buying the, the probability that a that's a good percent of that, of that package, like the, the people will buy their product. What's buying the product? It's transacting, you're transacting, you're, here's my money, give me your product. Because when they can go ahead and quantify, all right, if we get X amount of transactions, then they know, all right, if I could get a thousand transactions, this is my cost to go ahead and get the goods and services to sell for that thousand transactions, which means, if I could get if I could get a thousand transactions at ten dollars, I know that my cost is eight dollars, which means I make two dollars per transaction, which means I make two thousand dollars. If I could do that every day, I make one hundred four thousand in a year just for running these ads. Cool, not a bad deal, right? So the philosophical part is when you have the ninety nine percent all gathering together to go ahead and participate in a program that is essentially them investing their transactions in a small way that is manageable to them by being stewarded by a face that is accountable to everyone, what are they buying? Well, they're finally putting a price tag on population. They're saying, this is what we're worth. You know why we know what we're worth? Because all of us have created that. Rhino Buck's price is everything that we created together. And how do we create it together? We are all donating and investing a portion of our transactions to go ahead and take the coin and put it into our own investment account. Now, here's where it gets fun. Because it's all at market price, and because Rhino Retirement is all scheduled purchases, then the increase in scheduled purchases at market price will go ahead and exhaust the 1 billion coin quite quickly. Because when everyone's buying at whatever price it is, what about all the other people in the world? Where they're like, why am I buying Bitcoin or this coin or that coin? That coin goes up every single day. And in fact, 
what we're going to do every Wednesday and Saturday, like the emails we send out, is show you the statistics. There's a schedule to be bought. There's this much projected to be sold. There's this much of a growth rate. At the numbers, this is what the coin is intrinsically worth. Well, and it's not intrinsically worth anything. It's not backed by anything. That's where you're wrong. It's backed by the people. And if you want to tell me the people are not worth anything, I'll argue with you. But that's what it's backed by. Okay, so when the billion coin runs out and Rhino has no ability to manage that market anymore, one penny, one penny, one penny, what happens? Well, think about the shareholders of that market. There's a big percentage of people in that market that are all Rhino retirement people because we kept bringing them on, which is why I send out an email every, every day. That's where the big percentage of the market is. And we're going to continue doing that. We're going to build an affiliate program. We want the whole market to be those people. What's the other percentage of the market? All the people that are coming in that are looking to make money on it. They're profit motivated. They're speculators. They see a coin going up, they want to buy it. Well, if you're going to buy a coin, why do you sell it? Because you believe it's going to go down in value, right? Like, all right, this coin, it went up all the way. It's going to get sold. I want to take my profits out before it crashes. Okay. Well, how do you make that calculation? All right. Well, the, uh, it keeps going up. And over the last week, there's been a, a billion dollars put into it. And um, George, by my calculations, there's not more than a billion people that trade crypto. Therefore, we believe everyone's in it. Therefore, if there's no more buyers, there's only sellers. So we're going to get out before them. Really, that's a, that's a great calculus. That's kind of how markets work. Here's the problem. This market is only those people. It's only people that are actually buying every single week. And because we've amassed such a large population of people that are all doing small transactions, you're going to tell me that any one of these people are going to say, hey, I'm making all this money, but that $5 a week, woof, too much for me. Not only am I going to opt out, I'm going to sell all my coin because I want to go ahead and destroy the market. Well, no one has that ability. You would have to tell me that a large percentage of these people all do that simultaneously at the same time. And I don't see that happening. Like, why would they ever do that? So the people that are speculating, they buy it. But if it only goes up, why would they ever sell it? But here's the more important part. When you have these people that are buying it every week, they're buying it at market price, which means it doesn't matter what the price of the coin is, which means if somebody wants to sell it, which why would they? But if they did, they said, I'm not going to sell this coin. But if I did, I would sell it for 100 bucks. 100 bucks, I would sell it. Who wants to buy it for 100 bucks? Bing, bought it. Well, you would say, well, Anthony, that's really, you're building a system that's really taking advantage of people. Like, why did they buy that at 100 bucks? It wasn't worth 100 bucks. Well, first of all, you don't know what it's worth because you don't know what, it, are the people not worth it? But secondly, yeah, they bought it at 100 bucks. What's the next person going to buy it at? What's the next person going to buy it at? They're all market orders. They're all the same exact order, which means the only thing that stops the price of buying a bucks is infinity because it's just going to keep going higher. Here's where it gets super fun. Apparently, I keep saying that because it's, 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 it is super fun, right? Remember that search engine we talked about? That, like, that thing that nobody likes because everyone hates Anthony, apparently? Well, how about by this point, we're going to be like Elon Musk, right? Like people are going to know who Rhino is. What if we said, guys, I just like, do you understand why we did this search engine? Do you understand it? Everyone that's in Rhino Retirement, I hate to say this, I thought I would never say it, but if you want to stay in Rhino Retirement, you have to register with the search engine. Just list your business, suggest a business, list yourself, list your Facebook page, just get on it so that we can bring community over there. Because when you're over there, you're safe and protected from corporation. If, can someone please do that for me? Can you guys do this for me? Have I not done enough for you? I actually think at that point, people are gonna be like, well, we didn't know who he was. Like he had like a thousand people on a webinar. Like we didn't know who he was, but now that he's proven what he's doing, we're going to listen to him. And what he's saying makes sense, right? Like that makes sense to me. So you know what? Let's go do that. And I think that's the moment that the search engine actually gets populated. Now, what did we think the value was? At least 10% of Google, 150 billion over there. So when someone says, Anthony, what's the coin worth? What's it backed by? Well, it's backed by the people. Anthony, you're getting cute words, right? Like philosophical. What's it backed by? Rhino Street. Well, you didn't know that. Like, you didn't have Rhino Street until after the fact. You got lucky. Rhino Street, you were just selling a coin. It was a big Ponzi scheme, and then you, then you just got lucky with Rhino Street. If you want to believe that, that's fine. 
but this is recorded and I think I'm coherent. Like I think I'm logical. Rhino Street's going to work. It just matters of how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it the way the market tells me. I don't have any personal pride in this. And if we do what we're doing, and if we're able to be successful at Rhino Street, and Rhino Retirement, as you put it all together, then what is the offer to people? The universal income. Join Rhino Retirement, invest a percentage of your transactions, and when you go ahead and sell that investment, it's always going to be worth more than you bought it at. If you allow it to compound, you're going to be able to retire nicely. Universal income. Because everyone else is making money on buying and selling you. So why not buy and sell yourself since you own yourself? And this is the way that we've structured that makes sense financially, that we can do it in a scalable way. Universal income.